to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. Veteran fighter turned trainer Malik Scotch says Gilberto Ramirez versus Chris Billum Smith is a mismatch. Malik Scotch, part of Gilberto Zerto Ramirez's team, regards Ramirez as the top cruiserweight in the world. Because he's never heard of Jayo Pataya? Because he's a member of Zerto's team. Scotch, a former heavyweight title contender best known for training and fighting Deontay Wilder, will be in Saudi to assist Ramirez's lead trainer, Julian Chua, Chua. when Ramirez faces Chris, the gentleman, Billam Smith on November 16th in a cruiserweight unification fight in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The 33-year-old Ramirez, 46-1 with 30 KOs, is focused on building his legacy, seeing Billam Smith, 20-1 with 13 KOs, as a key step after his loss to Dimitri Bivial at light heavyweight in 2022. If you saw that fight, you saw that Dimitri boxed his socks off. That's what he did. And since then, Zerto Ramirez has become a bit of a boxer himself. He used to be more of a mid-range to inside pressure guy. Now he's a boxer, a jabber, a mover, and it helps. Because he may have been very big at super middle and very big at light heavy, but at cruiser, you can't strong arm these guys as easily. You gotta find some other way to beat them. And he did. Move and punch. Scotch, 44, who served as Ramirez's lead trainer for his cruiserweight debut against Joe Smith Jr. last October, a UD rebound off the B-Vol fight, is confident in Ramirez's chances. Scott and Chua have been training Ramirez from Sinaloa, Mexico, at Brick House Boxing Club in North Hollywood, California, honing their strategy for fight night. Julian is one of the brightest trainers in boxing, Scott said. I enjoy learning from him. I had Zerto for his first fight with Joe Smith, and he did well. No disrespect to Billum Smith, but this fight is a mismatch. Scott explained exactly why he considers the fight to be so one-sided. Zerto is a big, strong southpaw who's faced tougher opponents than Billum Smith, Scott said. He's a powerful body puncher with great angles and incredible boxing mind. Billum Smith is big and keeps coming forward, but he's a one-trick pony. Scott praised the 34-year-old UK fighter Billum Smith's trainer, Shane McGuigan, acknowledging his impact as an X-factor in the fight. Yeah, Malik Scott would know all about one-trick pony. He was training one not that long ago. Just think it's rich that Malik Scotch would look at a fighter and label him a one-trick pony when Deontay Wilder has been the one-trick pony of all one-trick ponies. And he reveled in it, saying he didn't need much skill because he had power. Remember that? I don't want to stay on Wilder too long, but he thinks that Chris Billum Smith is a one-trick pony. Is it true that Zerto Ramirez has faced better fighters than Chris Billum Smith? If he has, it wasn't at cruiserweight. That if you think of Arthur Abraham or Jesse Hart or Sullivan Barrera, Dimitri Bivol, those were all at super middleweight and light heavy, not at cruiser. At cruiser, he's really only fought Joe Smith Jr. and Arsen Gulamarian. Good! But Joe made his bones as a light heavyweight and Arsen Gulamarian, unbeaten champion that he might have been. It also helped that he hadn't fought in a year going into the Zerto Ramirez fight. He's facing Chris Billum Smith now. Chris Billum Smith is more seasoned as a cruiserweight than Zerto is. Naturally bigger. Trained by Shane McGuigan. He has a good trainer. But I think Zerto takes over in the second half, Scott said. Zerto has a dream team in his corner. I believe he'll become undisputed champion with Jayo Pattaya as his only real challenge. A decorated amateur from Philadelphia and 15-year pro, Scott went on to explain what ingredients make a coach special. Here we go. A great trainer teaches fighters the whys and hows, Scott said. Good trainers just give instructions. I believe in teaching for a reason. I study fighters, styles, and habits, even watching their corners to see how they operate. I think everyone in the corner should be mic'd up. I'm confident in my advice and want people to hear it. You want more camera time. He wasn't getting enough of that shagging at broad on OnlyFans. I wonder if he's gonna do any videos like that with Kate Abdo. I don't know, I like the chubby girl better. I think that Zerto has been able to take away more from Malik Scott's corner work than his buddy Deontay Wilder was. Maybe for Deontay Wilder, it was a little too late. He had over 40 fights. Then again, so does Zerto Ramirez. And he appears to be soaking in the instruction and applying it a lot better than Wilder was. Yeah, but Wilder was coming off a loss. So was Zerto Ramirez. He was coming off a lopsided loss to Dimitri Bivol. But he's been able to rebound in all the ways that Deontay Wilder could not. Talk about the role of a good 
corner, a good trainer, there is also being a good student. I think Zerto is a good student, or at least better than Deontay Wilder. You could see that Malik was trying to make Wilder into more of a mover and more of a boxer. I understood the strategy, the logic behind that, that if he can set up the right hand a little better, he can get those knockouts that he used to get. Create space and not get smothered like he got smothered by Tyson Fury. If he can beat those feet and move around, he can set up the right a little better. That was the strategy, it just didn't work. Not with Wilder. But it seems to be working with Zerto Ramirez because here you have a guy who, for the most part, is a mid-range to inside pressure guy. That's what he was. And they've turned him into a mover. They've turned him into a boxer. I think that's how he's going to beat Chris Phillips Smith. Move and punch. So what's intriguing is that this is a unification match. Both boys have one loss apiece. Zerto lost to Bevo like Chris Phillips Smith lost to Richard Reactor. Chris avenged his loss. Kind of looks like John Cena. I've counted him out before. That's a part of the intrigue. I thought Lawrence O'Coley was going to beat Chris, and he didn't. And then I thought Richard Reactpour was going to beat Chris. He didn't either. I'm going with Zerto to do it. I'm going with Zerto to beat Chris, but you see what the intrigue is. I've been wrong before. I could be wrong again. Two times already. Third time might be the charm. He will employ the same strategy he employed against Arsene Goulamarian on Chris Billum Smith because Chris is big and Chris is strong, but he ain't that quick and he ain't that light on his feet. He's flat-footed. Zerto can exploit that with movement by making himself a moving target, and even if Chris is durable and strong, he's slow. So I like Zerto Ramirez to win a points decision. And if nothing else, don't forget, this is a Golden Boy promotion show. For the most part it is, you can tell by the undercard. It's littered with Golden Boy promotions fighters. The only boxer fighter on the show is Chris Billum Smith. Which is hardly a co-promotion. No, it's mostly Golden Boy at the helm of the promotion. Bankrolled by Saudi. I wonder how Turkey feels about Oscar. The way he carries on publicly on his social media and what he's got to say about Eddie. Channel. I like Zerto to win, I do. So with all of these shows ending up in Saudi, Latino night, what's left for the U.S. fight fan? Quite a bit. I mean, just because they can't go to Saudi doesn't mean they can't watch the fights. Boxing has found openings in this post-World Series football season window to still stage some landmark U.S.-based fights in recent years. Deontay Wilder versus Tyson Fury won. In December of 2018, Canelo vs. Kovalev in November 2019. Fury vs. Wilder 3 in October of 2021. Francisco Estrada vs. Chocolatito Gonzalez in December of 2022. And Rafael Espinosa vs. Rotisserie Ramirez 1 in December of last year have each provided reminders that the sport isn't bound to a set schedule. Now, as an increasing number of major bouts have been produced and staged because of the riches in Saudi, the late 2024 U.S. boxing schedule has been minimized. Beyond this Saturday's Robson Kinsaysal versus Oshaki Foster rematch, WBC Super Featherweight title fight in Verona, New York, there's next week's likely sweep by welterweight champion Jaron Ennis and super flyweight champion Bam Rodriguez in Philly, along with the December 7th WBO Super Featherweight rematch between Emmanuel Navarrete and two-division champion Oscar Valdez and Espinosa vs. Ramirez 2 in Phoenix. Is that enough? Or is the defection of late fall, early winter bouts, like last month's Artur Better B versus Dimitri Bivol, light heavyweight unification in Saudi, the November 16th Latino Night Showcase, also in Saudi, the Fury vs. Usyk rematch, also in Saudi, and the undisputed Super Bantamweight champion Noya Inoue's return in Tokyo, reason for alarm. They usually save some blockbusters for the end of the year, and we're used to having everything in the US, everything in Vegas. Former welterweight champion Pauli Malinaji said on an episode of Pro Box TV's top stories this week. All of a sudden, I'm naming fights elsewhere. The American schedule has dwindled down. That's what it's starting to be. Malinaji's fellow analyst, Chris Algieri, said he's not bothered that the global sport is exerting its reach. Adding Americans don't go to big fights anyway. Yet, when a card like Golden Boy Promotions is November 16th show, that seems unnatural. For the Southwestern US, ends up in beerless Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Heads deservedly. 
are being scratched. They wanted to build up the fights in Saudi. If you're paying everybody, you should bring them over, Algieri said. The card is headlined by the cruiserweight unification between Zerdo Ramirez and Chris Billum Smith, with former 140 pound champion Jose Ramirez meeting unbeaten fellow Californian Arnold Barboza. I mean, we know what's on the end of the card. Yeah, we've been all through that. Al Al Sheik attempted an August 3rd fight card in LA, and it resulted in weak ticket and pay per view sales. Will we have another? Probably not, Algieri assessed. But taking so much elite boxing out of the world's richest nation is a transition worth watching, as the time difference leaves bouts like Better Be vs. Bivol and Fury vs. Usyk on American Afternoons, when sports television viewership is typically locked in on football. Oh. Usyk vs. Fury 2 will coincide with the first college football playoff games and special Saturday NFL games, further dampening the number of eyes on the heavyweights. Who wrote this article? Lance Pugmire. Lance is off base. A box a boxing match that's happening parallel to a football game really is apples to oranges because you're assuming that the football game is taking eyes away from the boxing match. It might not be. Not all NFL fans are boxing fans and vice versa. So the time zones and the fact that the fights are happening much earlier than they do in America, that's really not an issue. The more important factor, at least to the American boxing fan, is whether or not they have a stake, whether or not they have a horse in the race because if they don't, they don't pay attention. I mean, that's what happened the entire Klitschko era, as Vitaly and Vlad, his brother, both reigned parallel to each other. They took over heavyweight boxing. They took over the division. And when they did, the Americans stopped paying attention, since they couldn't produce a heavyweight equal to or greater than those two. That's the situation now. Top heavyweights in the world, the top two, are not Americans. So I don't think the American boxing fan is all that pressed over Usyk versus Fury 2, I don't. Nope. While the concern over that has been dismissed by some over the Saudis' apparent limitless wealth, the Financial Times reported this week that Saudi Arabia's wealth fund is reducing its international investments from a high of 30% in 2020 to between 18 and 20% moving forward. The focus on domestic economy is a result of a decline in oil revenues, according to the Financial Times. For now, Malinaji said on the heels of two Canelo Alvarez fights, this year, and the expected January pay-per-view return of popular lightweight Gervonta Davis, the current U.S. lull is just scheduling. I'm not sure anything's being lost. You could say some things have moved to Riyadh. I wouldn't say it's anything crazy. Inouye has rejected the notion that he should feel obligated to fight in the United States, given his ability to sell out the 55,000 Tokyo Dome earlier this year. There is, however, a plan to bring Inouye to fight in Vegas in April, and we'll see about that. While American and English promoters have balked at making some high-profile cross-promoted bouts over financial pride and broadcast factors on their turf. Al Al Sheikh has paid handsomely to make fights including the Fury vs. Usyk matches, Better B vs. Bivol, and perhaps about pitting four, four division champions Alvarez and Crawford. But the sanitized conditions in Saudi have zapped some of the life from the crowds there and deprived boxing mad locales such as Los Angeles, Las Vegas, New York, and Phoenix of cards that could also generate impressive revenue with more favorable broadcast times. Says who? Says Lance Pugmire. I disagree with Lance's assertion because if the money were there in Phoenix or if the money were there in LA, if the money were there in Vegas, then they would do those fights there. The fact that they didn't and they do them in Saudi. That tells you where the money is because that's where the fighters and that's where the promoters are gonna go. They know. That's where the money is. Without any context, if you read through Lance's article, to try to gain some insight as to what's happening to boxing in America, you would think that the Saudis poached it. When interest in the sport of boxing in the American boxing scene has been waning for years and it seems like now it's come to a head. It's come to a point to where you'd sooner get a big bag in Saudi Arabia than you would in America. What was once thought of as the mecca of boxing. Well, not anymore because interest is waning. So you have to go elsewhere to make your money. Boo hoo. Algieri said, the Saudi Arabia money is more robust and is naturally going to pull fights. Fights that weren't getting made in the US anyway. I'm not mad about it. Saudi Arabia is also planning to host a February 22nd card. Now you go where the money is, Malinaji said. As long as the fights are happening, it's better that they happen over there than not happen at all. And I've said that about a million times 
here on this channel about those people that are bitching and moaning and crying that the atmosphere, the atmosphere in Saudi is not the same. Well, the money. The money in America is not the same. The audience just isn't as interested. And you can't blame Turkey for that. You can't blame the Saudis. The American boxing scene has been doing this to itself for years, long before he came into it. I think it's got more to do with American boxers not being as good as they used to be. More attention to detail is required to really evaluate Saudi's role in today's boxing landscape when a lot of the fights they made weren't gonna happen in America anyway, like Usyk versus Fury, wasn't gonna happen here. Joshua versus Dubois? Wasn't gonna happen here either, that was for the Brits. Yeah, better be versus Bivol, would've and could've happened here if there was a lot of money for two Russian nationals in the light heavyweight division in America, but there wasn't. That's why it took so long to make. Was it gonna happen in America? You know that I remember before the fight was made, before Turkey actually put it together, I said, that fight's best bet of happening has to be in Saudi. Because they're the only ones with enough resources to pay above market value to satisfy the financial demands of both teams to put it together. They didn't poach any fights from America, is what I'm getting at. They didn't poach any fights from the Americans. And if you're thinking of Zerto Ramirez versus Chris Billum Smith as an example, consider that they tried to make this fight before it actually got made. Without Turkey. Here on the channel, we talked about what Shane McGuigan said that Chris Billum Smith would be willing to come to America, but perhaps the people at Golden Boy Promotions didn't realize what Chris is worth in the UK, that if you want him to come over, you have to pay him better. Now, Zerto Ramirez in America, he's not a big draw. I would say that Chris Billum Smith is a bigger draw in Bournemouth, where he's from, than Zerto is anywhere in the country, anywhere in the United States. But you guys want him to come over since you don't want to send Zerto over there. That's a problem. Under circumstances like that, the fight don't happen. The fight don't happen at all. So how could the Saudis be poaching a fight from the Americans that wasn't gonna happen anyway, that wasn't gonna happen at all. Did not. Saudis are the only reason the fight is happening. They're making it possible where the American boxing scene could not. Reading through Lance's article, I just got the sense that he's complaining about America not being the center of attention or the site for the biggest fights anymore, but I've been saying that for years. And that didn't start with Turkey El Al Sheikh's involvement in the sport. That's been gradually happening year after year after year till we got here. Now there are one or two big fights that you could make in America involving some American fighters, but if they're not happening, I ain't got nothing to do with Saudi. That has more to do with those Americans, their teams. And guess what? That ain't got a goddamn thing to do with the Saudis. So if you want to stimulate the American boxing scene and bring big fights back to America, tell the promoters, tell the fighters. They're the problem. Unless you want to keep pretending that they're not the problem.